Welcome back. The Level 1 Coach Podcast, Drew and Mikel here. This week, or this episode, we're not we're not necessarily on a weekly basis right now, so we'll say this episode. Uh, this episode, we're going to talk about, we're going to start at least, with this Harvard business study that came back up. It's a couple of years old, I think, but timeless and brand new. Don't have to be, uh, don't have to, it doesn't have to be brand new to be good. So, uh, <laughs> Anyway, the study talks about like kind of this paradox that we've been getting into off air about just our observations of coaches that we know, coaches that we talk to, coaches that we meet, and where they generally want to start and keep conversations and what they want to talk about. And when they tell you about what they're doing in the off season, it's very centered around like a tactic study or I'm doing this power play study this year or this summer. And I think we think if you break it down and this study almost breaks it down perfectly to Pareto, like 80, 20, I think the paradox in our industry is that 80% of us coaches, um, we think that, it's the hard skills and it's the studies and it's the projects that we do. And it's the ability to technically and tactically teach the game. That is what is most important to drive success. And 20% or maybe even less to some coaches think that it's the soft skills and the communication, the relatability, the emotional intelligence, what have you. And according to this study, and when you look at it just from what my intuition and gut says, um, I think this is more aligned and it's inverted completely. So the study cites that 85% of one success in the workplace is attributed to soft skills and only 15% to technical or hard skills. Um, let me kick that to you right away for some thoughts and then we'll go from there. What I find interesting about this study, um, is kind of what you're getting into as far as we attribute a lot of what, um, what makes the, what makes us successful or what makes teams successful to the tactics and to the, to the, you know, the, the overall teams, um, how they play, what the what the structure is, what the systems are. And those would be, you know, considered those hard skills that that everyone is thinking about, talking about, but also seemingly or hopefully doing different. And I think that's where people look to get their edge. Like, okay, well, if we have a better forecheck than our opposition, we're gonna be in the ozone longer and then you know, we're going to puck more and all that stuff. And and there's some truth. There's there. This is not to say that that's entirely false. There's some truth to that on a very technical level. But in terms of as this Harvard study uh, relays, and I know there's another one that you were looking at, the the big study guy, you were looking at another one that um, <laughs> that was explaining something similar, like where you can really find a difference or make a difference is in that quote soft skill area and that that's where i think not enough time is spent but where the most return on investment exists and if you're able to to focus on that and you're able to improve that day over day week over week month over month year over year how much better can you get as a result of focusing on improving your team's culture environment um i don't even know exactly what other words to throw in there but they're those like words that are really hard to maybe actually explain like ambiance and culture like how do you you can't it could take 45 minutes to explain what a team's culture is but what what i find interesting with this is that 
everyone is and should be trying to find an edge when you're looking at your team versus another team at your level. I think that's what that's what ambitious I don't even want to say good coaches. I just, just think it's what like ambitious good leaders do is try to find a way to make their group better, whether that's in business or hockey or anything. And what this study tells me is that, you know, most people are attributing all of their time or allocating all of their time to the technical stuff and not enough to the soft skills, the leadership, the the culture. So if you want the edge, go there because not a lot of teams will. And a bunch of teams are going to change a special teams unit or they're going to change X, Y, and Z over the summer that has to do with their their on-ice play. How many teams are going to now look at their culture and be like, what do we need to do to develop our leaders better? What do we need to do to make our freshmen feel more welcome? What do we need to do to make our team a more cohesive unit so that come February when we're on a three-game skid, we don't all hate each other and we're, we're understanding this is part of the process and we'll be okay. And – um uh, I'll give one little example. It's a different team in Division Three that I've never worked for, never played for, nothing. I just watched, and I thought it was interesting. They started the year like pretty tough. Uh, I think they lost their first three, maybe, and uh, they're usually a really good team. They ended up being a really good team this year. But what was really interesting was um, they had a really tough weekend coming out of that three-game skid where they had to play two nationally ranked opponents, and they beat them both. And I remember thinking at the time, like, damn, that that's an unbelievably close, well-coached, tight, good culture, all those nice words that they have that. Because how many teams start the year 0-3 or whatever they did and then have to play two nationally ranked opponents, I'm talking like top 10, and beat them both? Like, that's impressive. Because that shows resolve and a genuine belief and trust in each other as players and coaches that we can do this. Who cares if we lost three games? Who cares if we've got two big dogs this weekend where we can beat them? And they did. And they went out and had a had a good season and um you know, didn't let everything fall apart because they started poorly. Or I don't even want to say poorly, because they started 0 and two or 0 and three. And so I, I use that example because to me, from an outsider's perspective, that's a team that has the culture down, that understands these things matter. That coach, that coaching staff, those players, they're a real group, a real team. Um, not that that's not a good way to describe it, I <laughs> guess, or or a tangible way, but that's just, that's what I think of. So um, I think that's where the edge lies. That's what I find really interesting about this study. It kind of confirms maybe a lot of things that I've always thought to myself, just, just cause I like this stuff in general. Mm-hmm. Um, so I find it interesting that now we've got uh, people way smarter than me that, that go to Harvard or work at Harvard or whatever um, that are, that are confirming some of those beliefs, I guess we've, uh, we've talked about before. Yeah. We talked about it yesterday off air, just about some coaches and I framed it to you, um, speaking of like studies, like I'll throw what I threw to you yesterday talking to you out there Um, because I think it hits at a lot of what you said. Um, But like if there was a study that came out from the Harvard Business, what was this from? The Harvard Business Journal, whatever. Um, If there was a study that, was from a highly credibility stamped every coach reads it um or just like a major player in the coaching development space that everyone knew if they just said hey confirmed pre-scouts don't matter stop spending your time on them stop doing them stop thinking about them stop staying up late and not sleeping to do them Stop doing them on the bus on the way there. And what would most coaches do with the extra, How just say it takes an average coaching staff five hours a week. And it's with most of them, it's probably more than that. And they're listening to this and being like, wow, Drew, you are, you really don't get it, do you? But um, 
what would you do with those five hours? And I think that like to a man, most coaches, the way we've been brought up and programmed, they would like first fight against it and be like, I still think this pre-scout matters. Um, I'm going to do it just so they can do something. Um, And then if they got away from pre-scouting, maybe they'd spend that extra five hours like dialing in on their own team and like they'd watch more power play clips or more whatever. Um, But they wouldn't like take that five hours and go on another walk per week, go on another date with their wife per week, read another hour or half hour a day to catch some of those hours back up. Um, And I think to what you were saying and Rory Sutherland talks about this a bit and I pulled the quote as you were talking, but like, I think the reason that we do our very hockey centric film study work in the off season or in season and we spend all this time on pre-scouts is because you can track that and it's measurable and having like sure you can track conversations that you've had with players throughout the week but like you don't really get to know the results of those until later and there's like such a longer feedback loop and it's very murky it's like was that conversation why he started to play better? Was it the conversation we had last week? Um, was it the fact that I left him alone this week? So it's not as like cause and effect driven. And I think as coaches, we we need that for whatever reason. And I'm going to throw the Sutherland quote at you and then I'll kick it back to you. Um, Rory talks about in alchemy. He says, we have a culture that prizes measuring things over understanding people and hence is disproportionately weak at both seeking and recognizing psychological answers. I've never heard of that quote. I like it. You gotta uh, read Alchemy, dude. Okay. <laughs> I know. So measuring things over understanding people. Um, I mean that you just kind of went down like, I'm saying, you know, you were saying, I'm not sure why we do this. Well, that's exactly why. Mm -hmm. Because as you, I mean, we've gotten into feedback loops before and we don't have to go down that route, although I do love it. Um, But it's way easier to measure the hours spent, like you said, on a pre-scout or measure the individual meetings going over last weekend's film. And I, it's not to say that those things don't matter and don't make a difference because they do. And if you do them, like if you are able to, here's what I'll say. This is not to say now don't ever meet with a player individually and go over film. Don't ever meet with the power player, the penalty kill. Like if you, if you're running a special teams unit or you're running a, um, a forward or D group, like, I do promise you that if you meet with them week over week and you try to improve the things they do on the ice, it will get better. Like, is it going to get 1% better or 25% better? I don't know. That probably depends on how well you can teach it and how well they listen. But it's not to say to just bag all of that and just sit there and read a book all day. But in terms of like measuring things versus understanding people, you are able to measure, okay, we met and and let's say let's say you're using the example of like the forward group we met with the forwards we talked about this and then we went out and did it and then i i cut the video and then we did it again the next week i can measure how much um how many hours we're spending meeting how many hours i'm spending preparing all of this and at the end of the year well no sorry i'll I'll, before i get to the end of the year now i'll say understanding the understanding people part of this might be One week I need to meet with two of the forwards because they're down in the dumps and I got to figure out what's going on. And then the next week I got to meet with two of the D because one of these guys doesn't look okay. And turns out his girlfriend just dumped him or turns out something happened in his family. And then the next week it's your goalie. And each week you're kind of catering to what guys on the team need based on what you feel or see. And so every week um, think of it like, 
<laughs> when you're playing video games and like the the first line in the NHL has been out there too long and their batteries or their little uh green to red ratio the energy like, bar or, yes thank you the energy bar is down at red like you don't need to hammer line two if they're always at green for three weeks in a row don't just leave them alone they're at green get line one who's down at red line four that's down at red first d pairing down at red um and so why i say that is because at the end of the year i think what all of us do whether you are from the us or any other country in the world i think people always want to make patterns out of what occurred we want to try to find the pattern in whatever just happened to make it make sense in our brain and when you are logging the hours, like I said, in the first scenario, kind of the measuring things piece, you're, you're meeting with the, the forwards every week and you're putting together film every week and you're talking to them about this and that. You can go back at the end of the year and be like, we did this starting in November and ending in March and did it help? Yes or no? Well, we scored 10% more goals than the year before. We Our power play operated at 5% higher, so it must have worked. We should do it again. And the other way to look at that is the understanding people part at the end of the year, unless you wrote it down and were super intentional, you might not remember exactly what you talked about with each guy throughout those weeks based on whose energy bars were low. And so it's a much more difficult thing to measure, but I'm not convinced that that means it's not as good as doing the other thing and the measuring things piece. And I'd say that it helps to measure things, but it helps more to understand people and to be able to to figure out what guy or what guys need attention that week and need to feel good or positive or better. And how can I provide that? And like, it's it's difficult too. Like there are guys that are maybe in and out of the lineup on your team that it's tough to make them feel better with words. Like they want to play. And so anything you say to them is, yeah, it's nice. Okay. I'm glad you're giving me some attention and some love, but like, I want, I want to be in the game. That's my love language right now, not your words. And so like, you can't, you, it's not perfect. It's not, you're not going to bat a thousand and, and um, be the best coach ever because of this. But I think, you know, getting back to that 85, 15 or 80, 20, like that, those principles, like, you spend more time on the understanding people part and the measuring things, I believe, becomes just a little bit less important. It doesn't mean abandon it. It means figure out where to allocate your time to get the most out of your team or a group of players. Yeah, you hit on critical point, which I'll do a better job. I've I've teed it up in like three episodes this uh season and probably haven't done as great of a job as I could have done. So the critical point is just the least amount of effort for the most amount of change. So if you want to stop a train, the critical point is just hitting the button that shuts the thing down. Um, And I think the kind of getting back to this paradox as coaches that like teaching the game of hockey and know a bunch of stuff about hockey and pride themselves on being knowledgeable about hockey. We think that the critical point of literally every problem with our players is hockey centric or centered around the game or a skill or just something based in hockey. And to go with another video game analogy, cause I'm going to butcher the, if you see everything as a hammer, um, or whatever it is. I'm not going to mess with that one again because I trip over it. But like, if anyone's ever played Madden, I know growing up that like one year they threw a new wrinkle in and the quarterback had this like cone of vision and like Tom Brady's was like this big and could see the whole field and like Mike Vick's was like a little tiny V. So like you had to move that cone of vision instead of just press a button to hit a receiver. And if you are so prideful and like hockey nerd proud and like you do all this stuff in the off season and it's only the technical skill stuff, 
your cone of vision is going to be Mike Vicks instead of Tom Brady's. And what this study is essentially getting at, and I believe the truth in it, is the critical point is more often a soft thing with players than a technical tactical thing. So if we assume that, then more of our time needs to go to learning about communication and tapping into psychology, sociology, psychotherapy, stuff like that, instead of doing our next summer long power play study. Um, and if you want to do both, do both. But like the point is we have to widen our vision and improve the surface area of that cone of vision in our Madden video game as coaches, or else we're just going to see every problem as a hockey problem. And the example that I gave you that I'll share is um, not every coach is going to have a background in strength and conditioning. And even coaches that have a background in strength and conditioning, some of them think what I'm about to tell you is witchcraft. So they won't believe me anyway, but let's say a player blocks a shot in the foot and from what guys that have introduced me and taught me RPR, Cal Dietz is one of the like founders, um, main teachers. He's the head strength coach at the university of Minnesota with the hockey team. And what Cal will tell you and what all of his research and observation and testing on his athlete shows is that when a player blocks a shot that is shot hard enough in the foot, the glute shuts down. So your butt muscle, um, for anyone that's, if glute is too, too much of a technical term, I, I don't fault you for that. So your biggest muscle, your most powerful muscle, the biggest muscle that drives skating the rest of the game is going to be shut down unless you clear it using RPR. And I won't get into the weeds too much on that. But the point is, if you're just doing hockey studies all summer for 20 years of your career, and your strength coach isn't on the bench with you during a Division One game because he's not, um, you're not going to know that the critical point to get that player back to skating and playing as good as he can that game is hitting a spot behind his ear so he can fire his glute in the right order again. And that is an extreme example, but Hawkins talks about how extreme examples make the point clear. But understanding that what most coaches that are going to look at it through hockey specific, the rest of the game, if he's late on a back check and misses a guy by like three strides, the coach is going to say, hey, like you were just late on that read. Like, are you, was it laziness? Did you get a bad jump? And it's like, he read at the same time, the same speed. He just wasn't fast enough because one of his muscles wasn't working the way it should have been. Um, so if you only look at it through a hockey lens, the problem is going to be a hockey problem. But if you have this, sense of like critical point and essence and you have this range of knowledge at your disposal then you can actually identify the right problem and I think a lot of the issue we have in coaching is and I this is even like a business quote and I forget who said it but like sometimes we just aren't identifying and we're trying to solve the wrong problems and that leads you like pretty far off course um i'm gonna kick that back to you for some thoughts i think that example at least to me makes sense and it gets to this idea that that you're saying of like if you don't if you're if your cone of vision is so narrow and all you see is the hockey problems at hand or all you see is the missed back check assignment you're not looking at the bigger picture here of, okay, what, why did he miss this back check assignment? Is it because his, his 
effort wasn't there? Is it because his leg isn't working? <laughs> is it because he's just really slow? Like there's a multitude. Of, did he not try? Um, like there's a multitude of potential reasons. And as a coach, you should be looking at each one and figuring out, okay, like let's, let's play possibility and probability. So what is the, what are the possibilities? I just laid out like three. And now what's the probability of each? Well, oh yeah, he did block that massive shot earlier. So maybe it's an injury thing, not an effort or not. He's a slow skater thing. And so now you should probably weigh that probability of something non-malicious higher than something maybe a little bit worse. And I think you can play out the same um, scenario with, you know, like how you approach your off season or how you approach anything. And, um, with your team and, and, and you look at this and you, okay, like you say, I mean, unless you won the national championship, like probably everyone wishes they would have won a couple more games, um, uh, been a little bit better, whether that's 1% or 20%. Um, so you're looking at this and, and you're going like, okay, what are things we need to improve upon and where can we find this critical point of expending the smartest amount of effort we can and the necessary amount of effort to get the best return and to get the most out of what we eventually want to improve. And I think when you're looking at that, I do, I try to think um, in terms of that possibility and probability. So what are the possible things we can improve upon? And then what's the probability that if we improve them, we actually do get better as a team overall. And I'll, like for sure, before I got into coaching and when I was a player, like I probably definitely would have told you that it should be based on your system and I used to think as a player when we played really good teams and lost I used to think it was because we didn't have as good of systems where our forecheck wasn't as good or our d zone wasn't as good and as I as I do this longer get older I guess I reflect and I'm like if that I think if that were really true then everyone would want to run the same forecheck because there would be one unequivocally better forecheck that was guaranteed to work. And then everyone would want to run the same power play because there was going to be one power play that definitely is better than every other one. But go watch a game at any level and everyone does something a little different like and every part of the game. So there's clearly no one thing that's actually better than the other. And that's what leads me to think that or to believe that your culture and, and your internal team environment leadership is what can put you over the edge. And the way I, I was talking about it to you off air, and it's just the way I always frame it in my mind is like um, the talent, which I'll throw in there with the systems and the structure of your team, like that does matter because your talent and your team's ability to play with each other with that talent is going to dictate what you can do on the ice. Um, if you were to go take a JV high school hockey team and put them at the division three level, like we wouldn't win games, no matter how good our culture is, because we wouldn't have the talent. So like that, that part matters and that part makes a difference. But if uh, the way I think of it is if you don't have a culture, that's um, I guess net positive or a culture that is one that, that the players are, uh, willing to do things for each other and, and the coaches as well, then call it just a good culture, which again is is not a great tangible way of describing it. But if you don't have a good culture and you don't have a culture that uh, is net positive, like I don't, I don't think you'll ever maximize your team's potential and that you may still win a championship or you may still be way above 500, but I don't think ultimately you'll, win the national championship or you'll be um, the Stanley cup champions. If you don't have a very good culture along with the talent and the system structure in place. And so the way, like the way I think of it is that the talent matters, the systems matter. And then the thing that gets teams to be actually uh, longstanding, really good programs, really good teams is the culture. And I'd even take it one step further of like, you might be really good and way above 500 and win a championship, but the ability to do that year over year for 10 years 
is dictated by culture because talent and structure comes and goes. You can have a talent, uh, a talented team for three, four years at the college level. If those guys graduate. If the culture is not in a good spot, you dip down again. But those teams that perennially are really good, whether it's in the NHL, college, juniors, to me, it's culture. That culture is what allows those teams to be good, or I should say excellent, year over year. And it's not just coaches. It's leadership, captains, um, management, ownership, whatever you have at, at your individual level. So it, it, it'd it be silly to think it's just the coach. It's a lot of people all combined working together. But I think that's, to me, like we talk about critical point, like the critical point is your team's culture and how you can move that needle a little bit every year to improve. And you need the talent and the systems and the structure to come along with it. But you can you can beat your head into the wall with talent and, and structure. If you don't have the culture in place, you're going to keep changing the systems on the ice. You're going to keep changing the players you bring in or the talent you have on the roster without ever addressing that elephant in the room, the critical point of your team's culture. Yeah, as you were talking there, uh, I was trying to come up with like a, a mental model popped into my head um, and I was trying to craft it on the fly. So here it goes. Um, but as you were talking, if you, so like think of those Madden cones and then kind of invert that. So like now, if you think of a flashlight and the Walmart flashlights that aren't very strong and aren't going to save you in the dark from a burglar or whatever. Um, those $5 flashlights, the bulbs, individual bulbs, which is like your team's talent, aren't very bright. So your individual talent doesn't shine that bright. And the energy leaks and there's this wide, really weak cone of light because the light isn't concentrated kind of like a laser beam is um and that deals with if you want to get way in the weeds like the coherence of the light waves but we won't go there but anyway um holy buckets somebody stop me but uh anyway this flashlight um if you attribute that to your team like the brightness of the individual bulbs gets to your talent piece like people say and you said off air like Sometimes the best team off the bus wins. And then when you get in those really tight where talent is very equal, frozen four type games, anyone's game, like then you're other than puck luck and bounces and you can go there if you want. But like your your separator there is going to be what you talk about like culture wise. And that's just the alignment and how narrow, how focused how aligned and coherent that energy is so walmart flashlight versus laser pointer and then you're looking at two different levels of alignment and you're looking at two different levels of brightness of the individual bulbs um i'll kick that back to you yeah i think that that makes sense to me again um that analogy or example and it's what you want to try to do is at least to me is it align like you're saying the brightness of those bulbs as best that you can and that doesn't mean it's going to be perfect doesn't mean you're always going to have it exactly the way that that you need to or you want to but if you're always looking to improve that and you're always looking to make it better again year over year you're going to you're going to get to a spot eventually that you found success with and and it's going to improve your team regardless of who the talent on your team is. Um, and I think I said this earlier, but I think the interesting part when you look at this study and, and realize that 85% of the time is, or not time, but um, 85% of the difference lies in those soft skills. Like, but we believe it's in the technical, the hard skills. Like, I really do think that's where a lot of 
coaches or leaders could find their edge is is examining the soft skills, the communication styles, the communication techniques, um, your your team's culture, your team's environment, those same words I keep using. But I think that's where a true competitive advantage could lie because not enough people are focusing on it. And like you, you skirted around this saying, but like if, if all you have is a hammer, everything you see is a nail. There it is. Uh, nice. Nicely done. <laughs> so you're walking around and if, if all you think matters are the hockey problems and like, like we've kind of said, you're going to, you're going to be changing all the hockey things every year, all the systems, the players, and you're never going to look at the bigger picture, or the, the team's culture. And so, yeah, I think, uh, I think like you said, to your example with the bulbs, like you want to align those bulbs to have the, the brightest shine, the brightest light um, that you possibly can. It's not going to be perfect, but you improve that year over year. I think, you're going to um, find that not not a lot of other places, coaches, leaders, teams are doing that, and, and you'll find your competitive advantage in that. Yeah, question for me came up um, as you were talking, as we were both kind of discussing this critical point. It kind of popped in my head, and you can speak to this example um, because you've outlined it a little bit before on a different episode, but we're kind of coming from a different angle, but we talk about the critical point and we talk about the study being it's the soft skills and the behavior skills, even that are most important and drive the results. And talk to me about like your, what was the assessment and what were you observing? Because your critical point, um, seemed to be ownership when you guys were, when you were coming in and observing the first year, I mean, you were coaching too, but like you were surveying the scene like any good coach does. And just throughout that year, like you decided collectively as a staff that like our critical point might not be that our power play was struggling in year one, that Mikel was at Tufts. It was, like our ownership is lacking. So this kind of hits at our example of it is a soft skill in your example. It is what seemed to be the critical point. Um, talk about how you kind of went through that process. Yeah, I think honestly it came uh, it came from feedback from our captain at the time. Um, and also I would say like, some of our like our head coach and other other um assistant coach who have been here for five and ten years now the combination of those three guys like head assistant and then the the captain that we had i say the captain because he was the first one that brought it to my attention that said like in his opinion like since he had been here guys had always been willing to like pass the buck a little bit and he felt like he felt like when there was an opportunity maybe to take ownership of something individually that it was just so easy for guys. And, and he gave examples of guys older than him, guys that were younger than him in his class that, um, that just like, instead of taking ownership of like, Hey, I could have, I could have done more in the summer to be prepared to, to play more games. Once I got here, it was easy to be like, well, I don't even, I honestly can't remember like the, kind of classic excuse he'd provide but there would be like a an excuse in their mind and and he kind of like outlined to us like this is just this is just how some guys think right now on the team and anytime they're out of the lineup they have this yeah but in their mind and then anytime a coach provides feedback they have yeah but whatever it is and um I'm, I'm really i'm trying to rack the brain right now for like a good example he gave but i think i think this this kid was a little bit of a unicorn and like his maturity at a young age um i think he he just was he is a good leader um at, at the college level and i'm sure now and 
his real life once he gets to to work it in the real world um like he'll he'll be a good leader in whatever he does but he was i think he was able to bring that to our our attention um as a staff and then you combine that with the observations that our other coaches had had over the years and i was like ah this kind of makes sense like we've always felt this was an issue but we didn't really know like exactly where it lied and we didn't really have anyone at least to my understanding like just come out straightforward and be like this is an issue we need to improve this uh -huh. and it seemed like he was one of the first leaders we had um that was like really interested in improving the program for the betterment of just the program and not for his own personal experience he knew he wasn't going to be a part of maybe what the program could be in five years or ten years but he took pride in like wanting to make it better anyways. And I'll, I'll give a little example. We actually literally just talked about this yesterday as a, as a staff, like we had played a game, um, a tournament. It was the first round of the tournament, uh, like, a just a Thanksgiving tournament. We lost. It was definitely, it was definitely a deflating loss. We were already 0 and 2 or 0 and 3. I can't remember at that point, uh, to start the year. I think we were 0 and 3. This made us 0 and 4. And we had uh -huh. outshot this team. I'm not, you can go look at the box score. I think it was 58 to 29 or something. And we lost four to three. And so we were playing in the consolation game the next day. You know, like say it's a, a one o'clock game. We had like a 10 a.m. breakfast and we were down in the lobby at the hotel. I mean, us as coaches, like I'm not sitting there with my watch. Like, you know, is everyone down here by 10 a.m.? Like, <laughs> just i don't know i trust that you know when breakfast is you'll be down here and if you don't eat then that's your own issue All right so we um we're down in the lobby and i don't know at some point he comes up to us the same kid i'm talking about it's our leader and he comes up to us and he's like i don't want to say he's on the verge of tears but he's like shaky voice uh -huh. like he's nervous and this he doesn't get nervous at least in my experience at that point and he's like um I want to let you guys know that I, I overslept and I was, uh, I was down here at 10 one for 10 AM breakfast and nobody knows because my roommate was already down here and no one said anything to me, but, um, uh, I think I should be out of the lineup for today's game. Damn dude. And he's a senior mm -hmm. at this time. And we were like, okay, pump the brakes here. Like love the ownership. And I'm, I'm, happy that you feel the need to be held responsible but you don't need to remove yourself from the lineup like <clears throat> everyone makes mistakes and you had a one minute mistake of coming down to a breakfast and honestly i appreciate that you treat breakfast as like everyone needs to be here right at 10 a.m but it's it's not a team meeting it's not a lift it's not practice it's not a game which, which maybe we shouldn't have been like that, but from our perspective, it was like. Pick your battles. Exactly. Um, and so what he did do is uh, told the team in, in, in the hotel before we left for the bus that he was going to sit for 10 minutes. I can't remember, 10 minutes or five minutes, whatever the game. He was going to sit for a portion of the first period because he was late to breakfast. And those are like, that's a little example and it's not to say that that is like the catalyzing moment that then, you know, we didn't yeah. then go win a championship that year or some like cool Disney movie thing. Was that but this year though? That was two years ago. Okay. Um, I was going to say, if that was when you started 0 and 4 last year, I know you guys went on that run. And if that was like the galvanizing moment, like, let's go. <laughs> no, would have, again, that'd be cool narrative, but um, <laughs> that was my first year. But I think like that, that gives a window into, how he viewed things and how I think he viewed his role in trying to improve the culture and, and make things better for the future. Mm -hmm. And again, I've only been here two years, but when I've, when I've listened to like some of the things in the past that haven't occurred that are now it's things like that with our leaders where he left that he left our team in a better spot this year. So that when we had we had five captains this past year and four were seniors, they were able to learn from him for two years. This kid was a two-year captain. They were able to learn from him for two years and look at, okay, what do we need to do to now pick up where he left off? 
in the beginning of the year, it was crazy. Like we, the amount of times we as coaches and captains said that, like, where do we need, like, we need to pick up where he left off mm-hmm. and make sure that like this culture doesn't take a step back. Cause he left us in a good spot. And so as it, as it pertains to what you're asking, which is, this is a long answer, but <laughs> I think that improved that showed everyone what ownership looked like Uh and it exemplified okay i say i want to win i say i want to make this better but like i'm willing to harm myself for the betterment of the team and i'm willing to do whatever it takes in order to make sure that this place is one brick higher than when i got here Uh and i really think that like that that um like living breathing example of accountability ownership responsibility and leadership all those nice words that living breathing example showed everyone on the team like we can have this long term we can all embody this a little bit we don't have to wait for some other guy like him to come along in two to four years we can all pick up where he left off collectively and so yeah, like us as coaches thought, okay, like we could read this book as a team. And um, mm-hmm. this summer we're on the second year doing it and we're doing something a little different with like surveys and having them answer questions. So to get more feedback and and we we did some like little things like that that are, that are hopefully going to allow us to find out more insight about our team and our team's culture and where everyone um, sort of believes we're at from that standpoint. But I think that was sort of like the the big like catalyzing moment or or not moment, but like that whole first year that I was here, I think having him as a senior was what really, and as a captain was what really was able to, to have our team look at long-term we can do this. Like he showed us that we can, we can all lead in a way that is selfless, but also have success and also enjoy what we're doing. And um, yeah, I, I think, you know, he deserves a lot of credit as far as getting us um, from a, like a culture standpoint to where our captains were last year and, and hopefully where our captains are this coming year too. Yeah. I It makes me think of, so I guess the one qualifying question, just so I have clarity before I start in on this. So mm-hmm. he was there and did that in front of the team before you guys read extreme ownership for the first time correct that was okay. the season before we did that as a team okay so what that like where my brain goes with that knowing that is like we talked like you and i have talked off air about like century plant and these seeds get planted in the ground um they're not actually called century plants but that's what they're called because they can stay dormant for literally a hundred years in the ground before they start growing and all of a sudden one day when the conditions are right, that thing will sprout up out of the ground. Um, but some of these seeds on these plants are in the ground for 50 to 100 years without doing a damn thing. But anyway, um, like his speech and like action like that and any action, but especially action like that creates a ripple effect like in the entire, do you want to go? If you want to go big picture, the entire universe, but definitely within your team and your group. So I think like that, where I think why extreme ownership as a book club took off so well on your team might have been because that seed was planted a year ago. He's like, all right, boys, this is what it looks like. Um, Not that he said with the intention of, all right, boys, here's what it looks like. I'm going to model it. He just did it. But I think that gets planted in all of the other kids' heads. And then extreme ownership comes up and you start reading the first couple pages. And then it's like, there's probably more and easier buy-in and again, alignment to go back to that flashlight analogy. Like there's more alignment with that book amongst your group of 25 guys than there probably would have been had that not happened the year before um that's just kind of my way outside the outside perspective 
I think that's absolutely true. And I remember one of the one of the uh, younger guys on our team um, at the time when we said like we're going to read this book as a team. One of his first comments to me was that this captain had read the book and had actually given him a copy the year before and was like, you need to read this. Uh -huh. So there was already that social proof of like, Hey, he approved of this book. He He's read it or he's um, talked about it before. Yeah. And I think like that goes a long way because like you said, he's exemplified it, but he's also uh, given it his credibility stamp of like, yep, worth reading, worth looking into passed it along to guys in the past um first follower effect yeah exactly um so so for sure like that century plan idea holds here that like that that seed had been planted uh no one had really like actually maybe recognized it at the time that it was being planted uh -huh. and then all of a sudden when something came up uh over the summer it's like oh yeah this makes sense this sounds pretty similar to what he used to say or he would say to us um and sometimes like I think you needed you needed you needed that first. The like books there are a million books or a million like uh exercises you could go through as a team in the summer that might not stick. We did we did one the year before, um, that even we talked about as a staff, like should we do it again in year two? We're like, I don't I don't feel like that it was a team building exercise. Like we didn't feel like it really stuck with our team. Mm -hmm. and it's worked for other teams on uh at the college level and that's probably because of what you just said like there's some sort of seed that was planted with this other team building exercise that when the team does it it really sticks and holds and and they they remember it um for us it was reading this book be probably because of how our our former leader um had kind of left us and had I planted that seed before. So yeah, there's, there's, that's not to say that uh, every team should go read a book or this book or, or you got to find like, find what that is for you guys um, for your team, because it could be different for everyone. And certain things are going to have more of an impact, less of an impact. Um, we, <laughs> yeah, we all, yeah. The, the book is, this book is also military based and we have, we have developed uh through accidental means, a military theme to one of our special team units. So that helps too. Like it all ties into this like sort of culture that we have going on right now of like military buy-in and um, all that stuff. So there's, there's a lot of factors that go into maybe why something sticks and or why something doesn't. But I, I do, I definitely, uh, I, I had never thought of and definitely agree with what you're saying as far as that century plant that like once it's, once it's, the seeds are there you just don't know when it's gonna burst through and and when it does it's gonna stick because you've already had that uh that priming in your mind for sure yeah um let's wrap it there a little bit to think about at the end um if you like the show if you got value out of it if you just want to help us out and allow me and Mikel to connect with more people more coaches uh, you never know what's going to come of that introduction. So if you want to share them, share this podcast with them and let them judge for themselves uh, what they think. Feel free to share the show with someone you know, and we will see you on the next one.